your desire. So, thank you. So let's move on today. So I'll speak in about two main things. They, so from passion to compassion, how do we do it? It is through devotion. Bhakti Yoga is the process which will take us forward. So I'll talk today about how Bhakti Yoga at one level it is transcendental, but even our devotional practices may sometimes be get contaminated by the moods. And devotion, when it is done in transcendence, it leads to compassion. But when devotion is done in passion, it leads not to compassion, but to competition. In passion, the whole idea is that now I am the controller, I am the enjoyer. And sometimes you may practice bhakti, but the purpose of practicing bhakti is so that I can prove that I am the greatest devotee. There's no worshipper like me. There is that Hindi song, which uh, is about worship. So uh, maybe some of you know the lyrics that they say that. No. Ha, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so who is the greater than you among the gods? And among your worshippers, who is greater than me? <laughs> so here the idea is that I accept God's greatness. But God's greatness is simply a tool to my greatness. So <clears throat> basically, we all want to have, we all have an ego which we want to satisfy. And sometimes you may satisfy it through the means of religion. And that leads to one upsmanship. This is my God is better than your God. My religion is better than your religion. My guru is better than your guru. My temple is better than your temple. Ultimately, it is, I am better than you. That is the essential thing. So, in the third canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is uh, Kapila Dev is instructing Devahuti. And then he talks about how Bhakti Yoga is transcendental, but it can be performed in the three modes, depending on the consciousness that the person is. So, he says, the, the broad characteristics of the three modes, they reflect in the practice of bhakti also. So when we are practicing bhakti, devotion in the mode of ignorance, that means there is a lot of quarrel, a lot of quarrel, this is wrong, that is wrong, this is right, this is wrong. And then the quarrelsome mentality <coughs> is usually an expression of anger. Of course, there can be transcendental quarrels also. There can be differences of opinion and goodness also. But in the mode of ignorance, the quarrels themselves are very destructive. So destructive means that one doesn't really uh, want to know what is right. One wants to prove I am right. There's a difference, big difference. And I start trying to find out what is right. I want to prove that I am right. And with that mood, when that is quarrel, and the result is that uh, people may practice religion, but they forget the purpose. The purpose is to go closer to Krishna. And this world is a limited place of limited resources. So things cannot always be done the way we want, even when we are trying to serve Krishna. So you have to accept it and move on. I can't do it this way, maybe I'll do it in future in some time. So in the mode of ignorance, there is anger and there is quarrel. So in the mode of passion, now I'm going, I'm going very broadly over here, I'm going to go deep into each of these. But in the mode of passion, the primary purpose is to prove that I am the best. In, in this, in quarrel, when we are quarreling, the point is I'll prove that you are wrong. And not just in passion, not just I am right, I am the best. So yes, everybody is a good devotee, but I am the best devotee. So everybody can distribute books, but I want to distribute the maximum books. But distributing maximum books is good. But if the motive is, let's take this message to more and more people. It is not that I want to be the number one, rather I want Krishna's message to benefit more and more people. In mode of goodness, the focus is on purification. 
broadly speaking purification domination and destruction these are the three driving motives we could say the three modes goodness passion and ignorance in goodness purification i am doing this in goodness also we may not have attraction to krishna very strongly but with whatever attraction whatever devotion we are little devotion at this understand that i want to become purified i want to develop attraction for krishna so with that motive of purification we practice that is in the mode of goodness in the mode of passion that's domination i want to prove that i am the best in the mode of ignorance if anybody dares to challenge me i'll destroy them so it is <clears throat> we see that when we try to practice bhakti sometimes the mode of devotion the, the practice of devotion if it is not done with a devotional intention i mean practice devotion externally but if it is not done with a devotional intention then actually it can increase my illusion krishna sir talks about this in third chapter of the bhagavad gita in sixth verse he says karma indriyani sanyamya yasate manasa smaran indriyarthan vimudatma mithya chara sa uchyate this is one who externally pretends to be a saintly person but is internally dwelling on sense objects fantasizing when i can enjoy them and that person is fooling oneself is a mithya chara is a pretender so here what is happening the externals are there but the internals are not there so of course <coughs> having the externals or not having the internals that doesn't in itself make us a pretender there are various situations this is for all of us for example when we wake up in the morning we may not feel like waking up but still we wake up there are so many things in our life which we don't feel like doing we do it that is not that is not a being a pretender actually determination also means even if i don't feel like doing something i'll do it so discipline also requires that so what is it that makes this particular person a pretender and somebody else a strict practitioner that is whether they are trying to cultivate the internal feelings or not a person is a pretender that person has no interest in the internal feelings they want the internal devotion they want to make a show of devotion so when there is no when there is a sincere attempt to get the internal feeling but somehow at present i am not feeling devotion but still i'll do the devotion activity and i know by doing the devotion activity i'll get purified and then i will also start feeling devotion so if the intention for the devotional feeling for the devotional attraction is there then even if the devotional attraction is not there right now it doesn't matter that is not being a pretender so there may be the practice of bhakti which is done because one wants to <clears throat> make a show for others or one wants to become purified now when we move onwards if we consider in our own sadhana bhakti stage the inner outer conflict often is there externally we are going through the motions of bhakti but internally we may not feel devotional that does not make us superficial as long as we are trying sincerely to develop the devotional feeling so when we are trying to move from passion towards compassion so we need compassion before we can have compassion for others we need to have compassion for ourselves what does compassion for ourselves mean that means that all of us at different times need to have different attitude towards ourselves sometimes we may be very discouraged oh i am not able to do this happy so discouraged so when the discouragement is there at that time we will need to be gentle to ourselves we need to encourage ourselves so there are times when we need to be hard to ourselves there are times when we need to be gentle with ourselves so if we have been if we made a particular some mistakes there are some lapses because of carelessness then i have to be careful i cannot be lax like this that time we may be hard to ourselves i have to be careful i have to be conscious conscientious i can't be responsible but sometimes 
Like some mistake happened because we lacked the confidence. Because we felt I just just beyond me. I can't do it. At that time, if somebody will come strict with ourselves, this is not possible for me. Let me give it up. No. So at that time, we had to be gentle with ourselves. Okay, when you can't do it, do what you can. So for us to progress on the path of purification, we have our mind and we have our intelligence. So the intelligence has to act and make the mind harmonious. But how exactly the intelligence can make the mind harmonious, that will vary from situation to situation. So <coughs> sometimes we may expect unrealistically from answers. It's not that just because I decide no, I want to be live a pure life today and tomorrow I start living a pure life. It will take time. It is not going to work out overnight. So we need patience. Now I had a friend who was a who was a boxing boxer. And he used to do a lot of workouts, huge weights he would pick. And once he fractured his hand. And then after that, when he was recovering, he was just lying in bed. The people are physically very active. For them, if they're forced to become inactive, they become very miserable. And then his physiotherapist came to him and told him that now it will start exercising your hand. He said, what exercising? I can't even lift my hand. What exercise can I do? So he said, okay, can you lift your little finger? He said, yes. He said, so lifting this little finger five times a day, five times, thrice a day, morning, afternoon, evening. That is your exercise. It's exercise. Exercise was th lifting 30 kg weight for him. This is very well built. He says, what is lifting a finger? This is no exercise. He says, no, this is the exercise for you right now. So he started doing that and gradually other fingers also had lifted. Then the hand, then the forearm, then the full arm. And gradually the recovery happened. So, with respect to physical recovery, we understand that there are only small steps we can take. And gradually through the small steps, the big, big distance will also be covered. So, <coughs> similarly, with respect to our inner growth, we have to take small steps. And as we keep taking small steps, gradually the big changes will also happen. So, if we expect too much from ourselves, we are not able to do it, we get disheartened. We get disheartened, we feel, oh, I just can't do it. So there is the principle of in Bhakti, which is said that a devotee is Asha Baddha. Asha Baddha means a devotee never loses hope. Is always hopeful. Prabhupada translates this in Bhakti Samasindu as, a devotee has hope against hope. No matter how many things go wrong, in fact, a devotee says, no, I'll keep practicing bhakti. The example is given over there that it is said that even if Krishna comes to a devotee and says, no, you are hopeless. You are never going to get purified. Just stop practicing bhakti. A devotee will still keep practicing bhakti. He says, Krishna is like, you can't do it. But a devotee has greater faith in the process of bhakti than even the direct words of Krishna. He says, if Krishna speaks like this, Krishna is simply testing me. The process of bhakti is capable of elevating anyone and everyone. That is the universal redeeming potency of bhakti. And the devotee has that faith. So there is, in our spiritual life, the tension between what we want to be and what we are. There is our aspiration and there is our actual reality. And when we are practicing in the mode of passion, this tension that, oh, I want to be like this, but I am at this level, what should I do? This tension becomes unbearable and we try to cover it up. Now, Covering it up is, is different from not parading it. All of us will have this tension between what we would like to be and what we are. 
but by the process of practice, the steady practice of bhakti, we will rise from where we are to that level. But in the mode of passion, the focus is not on gradual rising, the focus is primarily on covering up. And then, as long as I appear to be a good devotee, that is enough. Whether I look a good devotee or not, that is not so much a matter. So at a gross level, this happens when <coughs> when some people say in India, there are many Hanuman temples. And at one particular point, there are four temples. All of them were trying to get the biggest deity of Hanuman. And they plan, we will have something like a 75 feet deity. The other temples will have 80 feet. This is like you have auction bidding, so they will do it like that. We will have 90 feet DT. We will have 100 feet DT. And then one of the temples, got, they all got very big DTs. But eventually, if you have such a big DT, how are you going to do puja? How are you going to worship the DT? So that DT then just becomes a showpiece. It's not a DT at all. There's nothing wrong in having big DTs. But what is the purpose for having big DTs? That is important. So when we move from uh, in our devotion, we, we cannot wish away the mode that we are in. So I talked about, we will probably, most of us live in the mode of passion right now. That is the predominant society which we are in. And from the mode of passion, we are practicing bhakti. So bhakti will take us towards goodness and transcendence. But the effect of the modes is not going to go away immediately. So what do we do during that period? So we need to have at least some activities which root us in goodness. So for example, our chanting, our study of scriptures, our hearing classes, these will bring some level of goodness within us. And then along with that, because the passion is there, we can't wish the passion away. So then we try to channel the passion in Krishna's service. Shri Prabhupada did that through book distribution. He, he kindled the competitive spirit of our devotees. Now, whichever temple was distributing books, he would encourage them, and other temples would try to distribute more books. And they would encourage them, they would appreciate them. So this uh, the mode of passion at one level, it can be a distraction from bhakti. But the mode of passion is there within us, and we can't wish it away. So what we can do is, we can regulate it and channel it. A channel means if we consider a, a river is flowing, the river just flows randomly, then it will overflow and it will, can, it will cause devastation. But the river water is channeled, then it will move properly in a particular direction and it can be constructively used. So we need to find channels for our passion. So in our profession itself, in our daily lives, our lives are quite fast paced. Many times our mind is, oh, you know, I want to study scripture. I don't get any time only. What to do? Yeah, it's true that we may not get time to study scripture. But the fact is, if so tomorrow we don't, now full day is free. Don't do anything, just study scripture now. Study for half hour, one hour, two hour. Start, what can I do now? Then we'll start thinking, you know, hey, okay, studying scripture is good. But you know, there's so many other things to do. Maybe I should distribute books. We have to build a new temple. Maybe I should get, get some resources for the temple. I should do this. I should do that. And the point I'm making here is the, the nature of the mind in the board of passion is that it will always keep us dissatisfied. If I'm doing practical service, the mind will say, hey, you're not getting time to do your sadhana. You're not getting time to study scripture. I should do that. That is really bhakti. This is just running around. But when we get time to, when we get time to do that, and we start doing that, the mind will say, hey, come on. How much will you do this? Do something practical. Come on, go out and do that. So the mind in passion always is dissatisfied. And he said, okay, what should I do? If I tell, okay, I wanted to say I should study. I'm studying. I said, go, go and do that. And we go and do some practical work with mind and say, no, come back and study now. What are you doing? So 
the so the mind whatever we do I mean, as long as the mode of it's in the mode of passion the mind will do one thing is it will keep us dissatisfied even if we go to paradise and everything is wonderful there the mind will say yes but <laughs> <laughs> So in the mode of passion, dissatisfaction is a characteristic of the mind. And that's why we can't take dissatisfaction very seriously. It's interesting in the 17th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about austerity in goodness, austerity of body, austerity of mind, and austerity of speech. And then he says, Manha Prasad Samyatam Maunamat Nigraha. Bhavasam Shuddhim Etat Tapo Tapo Manasa Muchate. That it is austerity of mind. What is the first austerity he says is Mana Prasada is actually satisfaction of the mind. So Krishna is saying satisfaction. Is an austerity. That means satisfaction is when we talk about austerity, what does it mean? I'm going to fast today. <coughs> that is the austerity I'm going to perform. That means I feel like eating, but I decide I'll not eat. I'll choose to fast. I'll not think about food. Even if I get think about food, I'll not indulge it. I'll not eat it. So similarly. Satisfaction and austerity of the mind means that in all our life, in our life, in the lives of all of us, there are certain things which are right, certain things which are wrong. If I look at the things which are wrong, I'll feel dissatisfied. If I look at the things which are right, I'll feel satisfied. So we have to make a conscious decision to look at what is right in our life. That will make us satisfied. Suppose we go to a program and after that there is a feast. Hmm? But it's a special feast. That is, everybody in their plate has got different items. Everybody has got delicacy, but everybody has got different items. Now, in my plate I have delicacies. But instead of enjoying the delicacies in my plate, I look at what has he got in his plate? What has she got in his plate? What has he got in his plate? And if I keep looking at what everyone else has, instead of savoring what I have in my plate, I'll be dissatisfied. So I have to make a decision. There's good enough in my plate. Let me just eat this. Let me be satisfied in this. So satisfaction is not just an emotion that we feel. Satisfaction is also a decision we make. We make. Satisfaction is the decision we make by focusing on what we have and not not watching, not thinking of what we don't have. So as devotees, <clears throat> we need to learn material contentment. Because basically we have limited energy. I, I can use my energy to try to improve myself materially. I can use my energy to try to improve myself spiritually. Of course, we can do both also. We have our job, we have careers, we can balance both. But here I'm talking in terms of our driving desires. If my driving desire primarily is to improve myself materially, then that will consume my energy. And then I will be able to have very little time for practicing spiritual life. So, at a particular time in our life, a devotee has to decide, now, this much time I'm going to give for my material side. And whatever growth happens in that, that's fine. It's not that we have to be lazy or irresponsible. But you know, we can even, in the, in the name of pursuing our career, we can become workaholics. The Bhagavatam talks about people, you know, the Bhagavatam talks about materially attached people who do two activities. So that they work hard to earn, 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 earn money and to enjoy life thereafter. But in today's world, people work so hard. There's workaholism. 
Workaholism means that people don't even have time for their families. What to speak of our God? Not even for their families, like unidimensional growth. And in this way, when people become workaholics, they spoil their health, they break their families, and they may grow in their career, they may be achievers in their careers, but they become failures in their life. So that sort of unidimensional success is like growth that is cancerous. There is normal bodily growth that is proportional growth. Cancer is also growth. But cancerous growth is growth that destroys all other body parts eventually. So we need to have a balance. So we, as devotees, we may decide, okay, this much time for my profession, this much, so I'll give this much time and whatever works out, well, I'll find that. I'm not going to spend my whole life just in pursuing these things. So contentment or satisfaction is a decision that we have to take. And when we take that decision, then we can move forward in more constructive ways towards progress and success in our spiritual life. So for establishing this material contentment, as all of us need a sense of that I'm doing something in my life. I'm progressing in my life. So if we are not doing something tangible enough for our spiritual growth, then we'll feel, what am I doing with my life? I'm simply wasting it. Let me start, let me get into my material life and material growth. So then, if we just become contented in our material life, but we are not seriously active in our spiritual life, then that material contentment will seem like a restriction, will seem like a deprivation. And if we just relapse back into materialism. But when that material contentment, we use that as a platform for spiritual advancement. Let me focus and let me grow in my spiritual life. Then that higher satisfaction which comes through spiritual growth will enable us to get the sense that I am moving forward in my life. So earlier I said that we can't wish away the passion that we have. Passion means that I want to do something, I want to achieve something in my life. So if we associate with materialistic people, then our drive will be, I want to achieve this materially, I want to achieve that materially, I want to achieve that materially. And if you associate with devotees, then we will aspire to grow devotionally. So association is extremely important for us, especially when we are in the mode of passion. When in the mode of goodness, we become more introspective and we become more internally driven. When we are in the mode of goodness, we can swim against the tide. In the mode of passion, because we are very externally driven, it is difficult to swim against the tide. That's why we need to find the tide that is going spiritually. So if we consider the ocean, if we consider say, the Indian Ocean, you know, from above it may seem just like one water body. But if we look Underneath, there are water currents. So one current may be going from, say, New Zealand towards Australia. And the current may be coming down from Philippines towards Australia. And the current may be going from, <clears throat> say, Australia deeper into the ocean, towards, uh, way towards India. So there are different currents going in different directions. And if a person is operating a boat, which is manually driven, then for them to situate themselves in the right current is important. If somebody wants to go towards New Zealand and the current is coming from New Zealand, then rowing will become extremely difficult. When they situate themselves in the current which is going towards New Zealand, it will be much faster. And similarly for us, the association that we put ourselves in, that is like the current. So if I put myself in materialistic association and then try Go spiritual, grow spiritually. It's like swimming against the current. Yes, the overall society is materialistic. We can't change that. But when we are talking about association, association is not just physical proximity. Association is defined 
primarily by the exchange of emotions and more fundamentally association is the transfer of desires association is the transfer of desires when we associate with someone if say somebody <clears throat> is there a sports in australia which is not played in india some sports yeah. which one yeah. okay australian football okay so suppose some indian comes indian person comes and then they have no idea what is australian football and then they're staying in a hostel and then they have a friend who is always talking about that a fan of that this player that player this match that match and then six months ago this person didn't know about that game and six months later, it was like a passionate fan. No, oh, spending time, spending money, spending energy, vociferously shouting, cheering, crying. So what happened? This is the association, the desire got transferred. The desire which was there in this person, in this neighbor, that came in this boy, this person also. So the essence of association is transfer of desires. So we may work with different people in our offices, in our societies where we are living. But if there is no transfer of desires there, then that's not association. We may, for, we may, for functional purposes, we may interact with people, that's fine. But it is when we associate with devotees, the test of association is the transfer of desires. If by associating with devotees, we get the desire to grow spiritually the desire to move towards Krishna, then that is when we are associating. That's like choosing the current which we place ourselves in. And when we place ourselves in the right current, the spiritual advancement becomes much easier. When we don't have that right current, it becomes much, much more difficult. Moving onwards now, if we consider that I want to practice devotion in a way that I will grow spiritually towards Krishna. So that is material contentment. This is, this, I, I consciously exercise material satisfaction. And then there is, we, we try to associate with devotees which give us spiritual desires by which we start moving towards Krishna. Now while we are doing this, how do we approach Krishna? When we talk about faith, many times people talk about faith in terms of there is, there is category believers and non-believers. So when you use non-believers, they say that there's a person who doesn't believe in God. Actually, there are no non-believers. Because those who call themselves non-believers are believers in the non-existence of God. So atheism is the, is the religion of faith in faithlessness. It is the faith in the non-existence of God. Because there is no experiment or no reasoning by which anyone can conclusively say that God doesn't exist. So atheism also requires faith. Theism also requires faith. So that level of faith is fine. When we are practicing bhakti seriously, the faith we require is something different. It is not the existence of God, it is the character of God. It is the attractiveness of God. Does anyone know how faith is defined in the Chaitanya Charitamrit? Prabhupada would often quote that. Shraddha Shabde Vishwasa Kahe Sudruda Nishchay Krishna Bhakti Kaile Sarva Karma Kruta And Shraddha means Faith means that if I just serve Krishna, Krishna Bhakti Kaile, Sarva Karma Kruta Hare. If I just serve Krishna, all purposes will be fulfilled. So what does this mean? That we, for as devotees, we need the faith that Krishna is sufficient. Now normally, sufficient doesn't seem to be like a very 
very big glorifier. Sufficient is, hey, you know, Vishwa says Krishna is abandoned, Krishna is all attractive. Yes, those are all, that's true. But at our level, the mind makes us feel, yes, Krishna, Krishna is good, but Maya is also not bad. A little Krishna, a little Maya, don't be fanatical. Be balanced. <laughs> the, the mind makes us feel like that. So as devotees, when you are trying to practice bhakti, you have to understand that Krishna is attractive enough that if I focus on him, I will get whatever satisfaction I need. So there are, in the mode of passion, when people worship God, and when in devotion, for the purpose of purification, transcendence, when we worship God, there's a big difference. In passion, we worship God for what he can give us. With the devotional intent, when we worship God, we worship him for who he is. So, I can have faith in God as a provider. Now, if I pray to God, God will provide me this, God will provide me that. So that's good faith. But more important than that, especially for a spiritual advancement, is the faith that there are many blessings which Krishna may give me, but Krishna is Krishna's greatest blessing. Krishna himself. If Krishna manifests in my heart, then he is he is the greatest blessing. Once he comes in my heart, then there's nothing more that is needed because he is all attractive. This faith is what will enable us to become wholehearted in the practice of bhakti. Otherwise, we will our bhakti will always be conditioned. <coughs> In the Bhagavatam, it is said that you should practice a haituki, a pratihata bhakti. A haituki means unmotivated, and a pratihata means uninterrupted. To the extent our devotion is motivated, to that extent it will be interrupted. Motivated means I want this particular thing. Now, once I get it, that's good. If I don't get it, what is the use of worshipping God? Sometimes some children. Now they tell their mother, I want this toy. And the mother says, no, not now. I want this toy. No, not now. I want this toy. No, the child starts crying. And the mother says, no, not now. And the child says then, ah, you don't love me. So the mother, we had done a hundred things for the child. But just that one toy that is not provided, the child starts saying, you don't love me. Because the child has at that particular time reduced the love of the mother to the providing of that toy. And the toy is not provided, the mother doesn't love. Similarly, in the mode of passion, we become infatuated by certain things. And when we become infatuated, then we think of everything in terms of that, whether I get that thing or not. Even God's presence, God's benevolence, we think in that term. So if we don't get that, then we think, what is the use of worshipping God? I, I pray to God, I worship God, this thing didn't work out for me. What is the use? Actually, Krishna can provide us our desires. But sometimes Krishna has a higher plan. See, there, are, there are many different desirable objects in this world. And some of them catch our desires. And then we start feeling, I just want to get this. And then we start pursuing it. But whatever is attractive in this world, it manifests a spark of Krishna's attractiveness. Yadyat vibhuti man sattvam shrimadurjitam evava tattadevava Whatever is attractive, Krishna says, that is its attractiveness. Where does it come from? It comes from me. So then, 
that particular object, its attractiveness comes from Krishna. However, everything attractive comes from Krishna, but everything attractive may not take us to Krishna. Everything attractive comes from Krishna, but if we don't see the connection of that thing with Krishna, then in chasing that object, we may go away from Krishna. So, <clears throat> if we are practicing bhakti and we, we get attracted to a particular object, I want this and we may try for it. If we don't get it, we may get frustrated and we may think, what are all my effort, all my planning, it went to waste. But if you have a more philosophical understanding, you say, okay, whatever was attractive in this object, even if I don't get that object, but still, the source of that is Krishna. So this is like a drop of water. Krishna is like an ocean. This is like a spark. Krishna is the full flame. So even if this works out, this doesn't work out, Krishna is still there for me. Let me focus on Krishna. So Krishna talks about uh, in 7.16 how people approach him with material desires. Artharthi, Artho, those who want wealth, those who are distressed, they come to him. Chitramidha bhajante maam jana sukritna arjuna arto jigyan suradharthi jnani cha bharatarishabha They approach him out of his various worldly desires. And the Sri Krishna appreciates them. Krishna says they are sukriti, they are pious people. <coughs> and then we again appreciate them. Udara sarva evate. They are large hearted, they are charitable. At least they are coming to me. Ramanacharya in his Bhagavad commentary says that why does Krishna use the word Udaraha over here? Udara means charitable. These people are coming to Krishna, they want their own, they have their own agenda in coming to Krishna. Why does Krishna call them charitable? He says that Krishna is so eager that the souls come back to him. Krishna is so eager that they offer their devotion to him that even if for their own purposes, not out of love, but for their own personal gain, if they at least approach him and offer some devotion to him, Krishna feels so happy, feels, oh, you are so charitable. That is the magnanimity of Krishna. However, from that point of approaching Krishna for some material desires, till understanding that Krishna is the most desirable object. That may take many lifetimes. So this is 7.16 and 17. Two verses later in 7.19, the Bhagavad Krishna says, Bahunam janmana mante jnanavan maam prapadyate vasudeva sarvamiti samatma sudurla Those who understand it, vasudeva sarvamiti that Lord Vasudev, he is everything. Krishna is everything. <clears throat> he is the embodiment and fulfillment of everything that is attractive. I don't need anything apart from him. That person, to understand it, may take many lifetimes. Of course, if you associate with serious devotees who are convinced about that, then it can happen much faster also. But that is the stage when we come, then we become wholehearted devotees. We become absorbed in Krishna and we become fulfilled in Krishna. Because we are not craving for other things. Otherwise, if that particular thing, we get too attached to it. Then, what happens? We become like that child who says, ah, this toy is not there, my mother doesn't love me. So, a particular thing which we ask for, it doesn't happen. God doesn't exist or God doesn't care. What is the use of worshipping God? That becomes that misdirects us from our path of bhakti. <coughs> so we have, we may have different desires and it's, it's not easy to give up desires. But what is important is, if we want to become devotees, we, it's not easy to give up all desires, but at least we make Krishna our strongest desire. Oh, I want wealth, I want power, I want this, I want that. It's, I can't wish away those desires if I have them. But Krishna will be my strongest desire. I'll put Krishna first. 
after putting Krishna first, if I get these things also, that's fine. But if those things don't work out, I will not give up Krishna for that. If because something is not working out, so I give up Krishna and I start chasing that, then that means I have put that desire first. Right? We put Krishna first and let all other desires be harmonized with our pursuit of Krishna. When we pursue bhakti in this way, putting Krishna first, then we march steadily towards it. And gradually, we start gaining the realization that it is Krishna who is the source of the greatest satisfaction. All other things are needed. If you get them, that's great. If they don't get them, it doesn't matter that much. <clears throat> Suppose somebody has come to, a person has come to know that I've got a, <clears throat> some relative has given a $5 million inheritance to me. I just have to go to that place and I'll get the inheritance. The person starts going along to that place. And along the way, as they're, they're walking along, some suddenly gust of wind comes and there's a $5 bill in their pocket. It just flies away. Now, start chasing the $5 million. But suppose they have to reach their destination by a particular time so that they sign the deed and they get the inheritance. They say, okay, this $5 million. Okay, I don't want to lose it. But if there's a choice between the $5 and $5 million, what will I choose? $5 million. So, for a devotee who is spiritually convinced about the attractiveness of Krishna, then Krishna is like that $5 million. And worldly pleasures and worldly pains are like $5 gain or $5 loss. So, the $5 is also important. But in the perspective of $5 million, it is not that important. So, in the Bhagavad Gita, it is said in 5.20, Naprarishet Priyam Prabhya Nodvije Prabhya Cha Priyam Sthira buddhira sammurho Brahma vid Brahma nisthitaha Says na prarishet priyam prabhya That is something desirable comes, one doesn't get elated by that. Nodvijet prabhya cha priyam If something unfavorable comes, one doesn't become dejected by that. Sthira buddhira sammurho One is firmly situated. Sammurho, not deluded. Why? Brahma with Brahman is the Taha. One is situated in spiritual knowledge with spiritual realization. And thus, by seeing things in perspective, Krishna is the most desirable object in my life. I keep pursuing wholeheartedly. And as we keep doing this, gradually the mind, think, oh, this is so enjoyable, that is so enjoyable, that is so enjoyable. The mind starts realizing. Actually, it is Krishna who is the most relishable. When I absorb myself in Krishna, the kind of fulfillment I get, the kind of peace that I get, the kind of joy that I get, I don't get it anywhere else. Therefore, I don't have to get so excited, so agitated about other things. Sukhataram aparam na jatu jane Haricharana smarana amrute na tulyam the great Saint Kulashikar Maharaj says that he was a king earlier and then he became a great devotee. He says that Hari Charana Smarana, the remembrance of Lord Hari, Amruta, it's like a nectar. And Tulyam, if I compare with that, other things. Sukhataram Aparam Najatu Jani. I don't know any other pleasure that is comparable with the supreme fulfillment, with the joy of remembrance of Krishna. And therefore, I will pursue this whole heart. So as we, we get, for us that experience may seem very far away right now. But it's not that far away. Because if we consider, um, all of us have practiced bhakti to some extent and we have experienced some transformation by the practice of bhakti. So if we, if we look back at where we were, there are many things which we might have been attached to and by the practice of bhakti, just went away, just came up. So we have covered a long distance. If we compare where we were 
And when we started bhakti to where we are now, we have covered a long distance. We have been able to overcome many worldly attachments. So we have, do have a long way to go. But being compassionate to ourselves means that when we feel discouraged, at that time, we look back, not look ahead. If we look ahead, we try so much distance to go. How will I go? Better give up now. No, we look back and see, oh, I've come so far. I never thought I would be able to come this far. Oh, this process works. If I just keep moving forwards, I will move on. By the grace of Krishna, I will move on. So the devotee's faith is that Krishna, what may be very difficult for me, what may be seem impossible by Krishna's grace, it becomes possible. And the very fact that we have practiced bhakti and come so far indicates that Krishna's mercy is active, it is working. So, <clears throat> there is a South Indian poet, he says that Krishna is so eager that we connect with him. And if we lie down and chant Krishna's names, Krishna gets up and eagerly hears, oh, you're chanting my names. If we get up, we sit up and chant, Krishna stands up and comes and hears, oh, you're chanting, very good. If we stand up and chant, Krishna starts dancing in ecstasy. And if we dance in ecstasy, Krishna embraces us and uplifts us and takes us to his abode. Tesha maham samudharta mrityu samsar sagarat bhavamina chirat partha maya veshita chetasa. Krishna says, if you absorb your consciousness in me, am samudharta, I will free you, I will elevate you. I will liberate you and Bhavami na chirat. It's not, it will take a long time. Soon. Prabhupada translates that as I am the swift deliverer. So Krishna is eagerly waiting to deliver us. And if we just do our part in the practice of bhakti, Krishna will do the rest. So for us, that diligence in doing our part will attract Krishna's mercy and that which may seem very difficult for us will become possible and relishable by Krishna's grace. So I'll summarize what I spoke and then we can have some questions. So I spoke today about second part from moving from passion to compassion. And here is focus on the theme that when we have the mode of passion within us, we may practice bhakti also according to the mode that we are in. So in the ignorance we practice bhakti will be quarrelsome. If there will be destruction. In the mode of passion there is domination. I want to be the best. In the mode of goodness we practice for purification. If I want to move higher and come closer to Krishna. So when most of us, when we are in the mode of passion, how do we practice bhakti? So there will be an inner outer tension. That we aspire to be something and we try to act externally, but internally our desires are different. So if internally there is no desire, no desire at all to change, just want a facade externally of goodness or godliness, then that is pretension. But if we are trying to develop the inner godliness while trying to act in a devotional way externally, then that is simply devotional discipline and determination. And gradually by that discipline, the internal will also get purified. So <clears throat> we, while practicing bhakti, have some amount of goodness to the diligent practice, to the diligent practice of sadhana, studying scripture, chanting the holy names, associating with devotees, and then we channel the mode of passion appropriately. Have some services, some activities where our passion also gets utilized. We can't suppress it, but gradually it needs to be regulated. And in the mode of passion. The characteristic of the mind is dissatisfaction. Whatever we have, if we are simply in materialistic life, then say, oh, you don't have a good enough car, you don't have good enough this, good enough that. But in the practicing devotional life, there also it will feel, oh, you're not, you're not doing enough reading, you're not doing enough seva, you're not doing enough that. And whatever we do, the mind will keep us dissatisfied. So we practice satisfaction as austerity. By looking at what we have instead of what we don't have. Like a feast, I look at what is in my plate, not what are in what other people's plates. 
<coughs> and this satisfaction uh, will make us feel passive and will make us feel i am not doing anything in my life if that is all we aim for we need a sense of motion and achievement in our life that's why we try to move upward spiritually and for a spiritual progress we need association the essence of association is transfer of desires and just like a uh, boat traveler needs to find the right current so that they can move fast like that the association that we place ourselves in is the current so if we place ourselves in materialistic association then spiritual advancement will become very difficult place ourselves in spiritual association that current will help us move towards krishna and the mode of goodness we are a little more introspective and internally driven in the mode of passion we are very externally influenced so good association is extremely important and <coughs> while practicing bhakti in good association with material contentment we have to recognize that faith is not just in god's existence but in god's sufficiency that god is in a krishna is enough for my satisfaction so whatever is attractive in this world some some things i may get some things i may not get but i won't become like a child who says that mother doesn't give the toy you don't love me you don't think that just because something doesn't work out in our life you think that krishna doesn't care yeah whatever i might have got through getting that particular object i'll get all that and more if i develop my relationship with krishna because everything attractive manifests a spark of krishna's all attractiveness and even if we can't give up all our desires we can subordinate those desires to the desire for krishna make krishna our strongest desire and when we pursue bhakti in this way the mind which is craving for this and that and that as it gets exposed more and more to krishna it starts getting the realization that there is nothing as relishable as krishna and when that realization comes then the mind becomes our friend becomes absorbed in krishna and we experience life's supreme happiness sukhataram aparam na jahatu jane thank you very much hare krishna so are there any questions yesterday there were several questions which we couldn't ask so i thought i'll stop a little earlier today yes bro Yeah. Um, gener- we know that the mind is a subtle element um, part of the subtle body. Yeah. Um, generally, when I think of an element, I think of things like earth or fire. They're they're just mm. dead elements. They don't. Yeah. Uh, they're stationary. Whereas the mind is an element, but it seems to be very active. It's not just sitting. It's very active. Yeah. So. How can it be an element yet still be so active? In the sense that okay, good question. It's active to the point that it actually acts like an energy. Yeah. It 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 literally pulls you down, takes you in different directions, and it's it's not acting like there's something. There. That's true. I got your question. So if the mind is an element, how can it be so active, and how can it act as our enemy? Yes. If you consider a computer, there's the hardware and there's the software. So the mind is like the software. The body and the bodily element, like earth, water, fire, air, they are like the hardware. So the software is also unconscious, but the software is not inactive. The software has certain default settings. And if I say I have visited a site for news, I read and why times. in my browser as soon as i type n immediately it auto completes and why types why because that's what i have chosen in the past that become like a auto complete so similarly based on the kind of desires we have entertained in the past the mind auto completes so when the mind starts auto completing like that it auto completes based on past conceptions and <clears throat> and because in the past mostly we were indulging material things so therefore 
it takes our consciousness towards worldly things and we have to pull it back so the mind has got default settings i use a <coughs> i use a speech to text software to read whenever i write articles now to proofread them and other i read it out so once i wrote an article in which i wrote the soul is satchitananda the software was reading it the soul is saturday chitananda <laughs> So the softwares, software was meant to do autocorrect of sat, sat, or Saturday. But here, in this case, the autocorrect made it incorrect. So then I had to go back and recorrect it. So like that, what happens with us is that we all, we all have a genuine need for happiness. But based on our past choices. Certain promptings come up. See, for example, hunger and the need for food, it's a genuine need. But now what I eat, what I'll be attracted to eating, that will depend on the kind of food that I have eaten in the past. So if I have eaten a lot of fatty food, then as soon as I get, get, think of food, I'll not think of salad. I'll think of some potato chips or some sweet, some food which is more fatty, some burger or whatever. <clears throat> so the setting is because it's a default setting which is there in a particular way, we need to change that. So for example, if I want to go to news.iscon.com, I want to read something about ISCON. As soon as I type N, it's going to come in my types. But if I keep typing an N and then instead of using the autocomplete, I type news.iscon.com. Do it once, I do it twice, I do it thrice, I do it ten times. The more I do it, the computer's browser is also noting it. And then eventually, when I type N, the autocomplete will come as news or com, not N by times. So the mind is basically a creature of habit. So whatever we have done repeatedly in the past, that it will prompt. And based on those prompts, we will feel a drag in that direction. But if we keep consistently making the right choices, then gradually those choices will become the prompts. So the mind is insentient but not inactive because it is like a software which contains its own preferences or default settings based on our past choices. And to avoid those uh, autocompletes to complete whatever we are doing, we have to be very conscientious. And by that conscientiousness, that will change gradually. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, so there are the uh, state of mind. The? So there are the austerity of mind. Aust austerity of mind, okay. Okay. I heard Australian mind. <laughs> yeah. 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 When I'm looking at myself back three years, before just recently, I realized uh, I'm focusing on negative things. I saw comments like Bhakti uh, Sadhana. Driving to be more from that point. Okay, yes. So if I'm habituated to say thinking negatively that oh I'm not doing this right, I'm not doing that right. So I may do the austerity of mind and look at what all I have done in Bhakti, what all changes have happened in my life. So but still I also want to do more. So how do we manage this too. On one side, look back and feel confident that things are working at the same time move forwards. Yes, essentially, 
we understand that our relationship with krishna is a relationship of service so now as a service to krishna we have to find out in different situations how best i can serve so <clears throat> our emotions can sometimes work for us sometimes they can work against us and sometimes the same emotion at a at a particular situation may work for us but another situation may work against us so if i look back i think oh i come this path that can lead to confidence and this process does work i keep practicing this process it will help me to move onwards but at the same time If I look back and think, oh, I've come so far. I'm so advanced. Look at all these people; they're so fallen. That leads to complacency. That leads to condescension. Then that emotion is unfavorable. So there is. Uh, we want to. Our emotions are extremely powerful, and we want to channel the power of emotion so that it helps us in the growth of our devotion, not obstructs us. so if i am feeling very discouraged then the discouragement will obstruct me so i want to feel encouraged i want to feel confident but i don't want to feel complacent so we have to use our intelligence to choose the right emotions we feel different emotions at different times but it is depending on which emotion we dwell on that emotion will grow so <clears throat> in the ramayana at one time uh, lakshman gets very angry with kai kai with um, everybody in ayodhya because they have exiled ram and he is very suspicious of bharat also but when bharat comes and asks for ram's paduka and he goes back the lakshman realizes that his suspicion and anger towards bharat was unfounded so then he asks ram that why do i get so angry lakshman is quite the uh, if in in today's language we could say lakshman is the example of the angry young man <laughs> he used to get angry very quickly so why do i get angry so quickly so ram takes like the role of elder brother he pats his on the shoulder on the back is no you are a sentimental person so then lakshman asks are sentiments bad So Ram says, "No, not at all. Sentiments are not bad. Sentiments are the ornaments of life. They make life worth living. But he says we need to choose those sentiments that take us toward dharma, not those sentiments which take us away from dharma. So we are we can't wish away emotions. Emotions are required." but some emotions they inspire us to do the right thing they inspire us to act dharmically some emotions will will impel us to act dharmically so we have to we are not just the feelers of our emotions we are also the choosers of our emotions so when i look back i i can either feel complacency or i can feel confidence so i choose the emotion of confidence not the emotion of complacency and then with that confidence i can practice bhakti enthusiastically and that will inspire me yes this process has worked so let me make it work now let me practice again and in that way we can keep moving forwards okay thank you any other questions oh yes yeah thank you for the nice class just going to the point from where you said Whatever we see attractive and whatever we want to get in this material world, hmm. if we understand that Krishna can provide that, and Krishna is sufficient to provide. Hmm. For example, if there is something attractive, that we said as well, that we can accept it, and that can be derived from Krishna. In the, in the initial stages, obviously, that looks quite, although that's fact, it, it might be quite inconceivable to connect. Hmm. So how do we until we it becomes conceivable? How do we spend time? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, 
Yeah, to conceive that the attractive objects of this world, their attractiveness comes from Krishna, it's not so easy to conceive that. So till that time, how do we move forwards? <clears throat> it's a process of gradual realization and it's also a process of gradual purification. We are not told that we have to give up all worldly objects. We uh, we do live in the world. We interact with the world, and you know, we may we may seek and get some worldly objects also. The important thing is we don't let that pursuit take us away from Krishna. We will all develop realizations gradually, and for that realization to develop, we need to keep practicing bhakti. See, there are some truths in bhakti which we just hear, we get it, yes, this is true. I met one devotee in America, the Prabhupada disciple. He was telling that, I asked him how he was attracted to Krishna consciousness. He said that although he was born in a very well-to-do family, he, he had a lot of difficulties in his life and he saw a lot of uh, people get into drugs and suffer and all that. So he came to a scientific program in the temple and he heard the devotee speaking, this world is a place of misery. He says, at last someone is speaking the truth. <laughs> Everyone else is saying, oh, you do this, everything will be happy. You do this, everything will be happy. Now oh, somebody is speaking the truth. So some, we, there are some truths we hear, we just get them. Yes, this is right. Some truths, we have to deliberate a little bit. So if I say I'm not the body and the soul, but then I feel when the body is cut, I feel pain. When the body is comforted, I feel joy. So how can I not be the body? I have to think a little bit about it. Yeah, but when I sleep, the body is feeling nothing. Still I dream and I experience. That means the experiencer is not the body. I, I may experience flying somewhere, watching something, doing this, doing that. And I experience those emotions. So the point which I'm making is, some points may require some reflection to assimilate. Some points may just require practice and realization. So, so it will come gradually, more and more. What do we try to do is, with whatever realization we have, we practice bhakti. So, <clears throat> We practice the process of bhakti and whatever objects are around us, we sometimes allure us, we make sure that they don't take us away from the path of dharma. Krishna says, dharma aviruddho bhuteshu kamosmi bhardarsha. Now kama can mean a sensual desire or kama can generically mean any desire. So you know there are these four purushartha, dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha. Dharma is doing the release activities. Artha is worldly proper prosperity. Kama is the fulfillment of desires. So it is not said that we have to give up all Kama. That will gradually happen by purification. But in the ruling course of life, at least we don't let, we don't let the Kama make us go against Dharma. So we fulfill our desires in a righteous way. And if you're doing that, by the practice of dharma, we will gradually get the realization. Just the indulgence will not give us the realization. If I just indulge in sense objects and enjoy them, what will happen by that? I will get frustration. Oh, I thought this is so much enjoyment, but there's no enjoyment over it. Not so much enjoyment. But then the mind is so insidious, it makes you Enjoy some other object. Do something. That will give you pleasure. That will give you pleasure. That will give you pleasure. And in that way, we will stay dissatisfied. It's like I chase one mirage. I don't get water. But I see ten other mirages. And I keep chasing them. I keep chasing them. But if I have heard before and understood, that in a desert there is something called mirages. I saw this was a mirage also. So I'm not going to chase one more mirage after this. So, then I will turn away from the mirages and then move towards the oasis. So basically, 
some things we will realize just by hearing some things hearing plus experience will gradually give the realization so when if that's the process we have to go that's fine but while seeking the experience we don't go out of the process of dharma we have to follow the process of dharma and then gradually through the dharmic process where we are hearing and then we are experiencing we put the two together and realize this is not that attractive and then when we uh, connect with krishna get the higher satisfaction coming from krishna then that helps us to uh, get more realization of krishna's all attractiveness and then that connection this where does its attractiveness come from you now some persons some people look very good now they may do some decoration some makeup to look good but most of the looks they come with birth now if he says sugar it's sweet now where does the sweetness of sugar come from it's not that when sugar is created sugar did something to make itself sweet it's just there where did it come from oh, it it actually come it's mystical if you go at the uh, atomic level in science and science focuses on what they call as primary qualities primary qualities is length breadth mass like that but the second they call secondary qualities as taste smell be- form beauty like beauty like all those things which we experience in the senses now exactly how the fundamental particles they lead to the secondary qualities the atoms they are simply made of electrons and protons and neutrons and they are basically colorless tasteless now we know that if a particular element is added or a particular compound is added at a particular taste comes but that compound is also ultimately made of the same combination of atoms and molecules only so where does this secondary qualities of science called where it comes from it's actually a mystery so the <clears throat> the arrangement of nature is such that science sees particular things it looks at primary qualities but there are qualities beyond that also so we see that the taste of sugar the taste of gulab jamun that taste is, is actually by the arrangement of krishna so krishna has endowed different objects with different attractive characteristics so that realization gradually comes as we become purified and our intelligence becomes more and more appreciative of krishna but till then we, we may pursue our desirable objects but we pursue them within the limits of dharma does that answer your question thank you any other questions yes mata ji okay yeah we have to Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, does the quantity of service matter, or is it the quality of a consciousness that matters? Yes, the quality of consciousness is most important, and the quantity can sometimes enhance the quality. It depends on person to person. Some people they f- feel one thing that's enough for me. Some people, unless they're doing ten things, they feel I'm not doing anything only. So it it there is there is room for individuality in bhakti. So we have to find out how I function the best. I mean, we don't have to be in a competitive mood with anyone. Uh, if I find that one service is what I can do and I do it well, that's fine. but we don't have to limit ourselves to that as devotees we would like to do more and more for krishna it is that that when radha rani cooks for krishna in the spiritual world she has 50 stoves which are on simultaneously she's cooking on all of them moving from one pot to another pot stirring this moving changing the gas and she's cooking everything everything she cooks perfectly that's extraordinary ability but she tried to try to do her best for krishna says so we have to find out how i can serve krishna the best the important thing is absorption so in general for us because we do have the mode of passion so if we do not have adequate engagement then the lack of engagement causes distraction 
So it's important that we have adequate engagement and we need time for introspection. So introspection should also be done purposefully. So if we uh, find ourselves constructively engaged, whether it's one service or 10 services, it doesn't matter. As a devotee's desire is always to do more services. But the important thing is we try to absorb ourselves in Krishna. And uh, generally, if you do one service well, and we find that we are absorbed in Krishna, then gradually we find out how I can do more services also. But yes, the quality of consciousness is most important. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. So, one last question. We have a couple of minutes. Okay, yes, Madhuri. This is uh, in terms of measuring of the Bhakti Prabhu, um, how do we actually know that are we actually acting or just acting? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, in terms of measuring our Bhakti, how do we know whether we are actually acting in devotion or just acting? Yeah. <laughs> Um, actually, even if we are acting, at least we are acting in devotion. That will also purify. So the important thing is there can be acting which can be done in so many other places. We are doing it in Krishna's context. So some contact with Krishna is there. That will also purify. But broadly speaking, there are two main characteristics. Bhakti Pareshanu Bhava Virakti Ranyantracha. Bhakti is a process which gives us para isha anubhav. Anubhav is experience. Para is the transcendental. Isha is the Lord. So that transcendental Lord, we experience Him through the practice of bhakti. So when the darshan opens, we may some people may come and say, "This is nice decorated uh, images," but if I have bhakti, then I experience this is Krishna is all attractive. And then if that experience comes. That is the internal joy that we experience. And the result of that externally is Virakti We don't crave for other things. So we can see these two ways. Internally, how much there is attraction to Krishna? How much there is satisfaction in Krishna? And externally, how much there is detachment from other things? If these two are coming steadily, then that means we are growing in our so thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki, Shri Gopinath Bhagwan ki, Dai Gaur Premande. Yeah. So we just have a few books here and a few pen drives. If you want, you can take them. They're available here. Thank you. Thank you.